Uh, we have James Benham and Kelly Raylan Enns from Manitoba Wildlands. They're going to introduce first and foremost who they are and what Manitoba Wildlands does. And they're going to talk about climate change, the basics, climate change in the prairies in Manitoba. And they're going to talk about how the climate change can affect agriculture. And they're going to talk, end with talking about what we can do, hopefully with some uh, informal discussions. So, can you please welcome, help me welcome, James and Helen. Thank you all for uh, coming tonight. It's uh, a very exciting opportunity always to come and speak and to share with a group of people interested uh, about climate change, uh, especially uh, in this day and age when it is becoming more and more obvious that climate change is a uh, fact of reality for all of us, regardless of where we are on this planet. Uh, as Tiffany mentioned, James and I are from Mount of Wildlands. And Mount of Wildlands is a non-profit environmental organization that has been around for about 15 years. So the main goals of uh, Mount of Wildlands is, in general, to inform the public, uh, to make accessible information, and also uh, make accessible those organizations that are supportive of community projects, supportive of individuals, and supportive of creating a sustainable future. Um, one of the main, obviously, we're called Manitoba Wildlands. One of our main focuses is on uh, working to protect Manitoba's lands and waters. Um, one of our specialties is the Royal Forest of Manitoba. We have done a lot of work with First Nations on the east side of Lake Winnipeg. We work uh, quite closely with First Nation communities when we are asked, when we are invited in to uh, develop uh, land use maps, uh, oral history maps, uh, and in general basically put all of the community information into an atlas for that community so that they have the information, so that they can talk amongst themselves and actually have a common understanding of what they have. Climate change is changes in temperature, rain, snow, humidity, wind, seasons, and other changes, and the really important aspect to stress is it's long-term change. So it's not how the weather changes between one year and the next, or one day and the next, but rather it's looking at long-term trends. I think it's, it's important to recognize that there is a strong scientific consensus about climate change. And, you know, there's, there's very little doubt that it's happening, and there's very little doubt that humans are a contributing factor to it. And organizations like the Canadian Meteorological Society, uh, the National Academies of Science have all came on board this. And these are sort of neutral, objective, scientific organizations. And so the theory there of, of climate change is basically, you can see the tight fit here, is that if you look at, on the one side we have temperature, and on the other side we have CO2 concentrations expressed in parts per million. And you can sort of see that the two lines track each other quite well. And what's most worrisome is that parts per million is going up, 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 up. And Obviously, the temperature is likely to fall. So we can sort of take a look at measured temperatures since 1850 in terms of surface temperature. That's the red line right there. And we're looking at ocean heat content on the blue line. And once again, you can see a definite warming trend right here in the past 50 years. And of course, that's what the worry is. And then here's just a graph looking at global carbon dioxide emissions. And once again, we can see that they are growing and they have been growing steadily. So the major greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, uh, methane, and, and there are other greenhouse gases as well, but those are the three big ones. Uh, when we're looking at carbon dioxide, probably the one you're most familiar with is primarily the human causes of carbon dioxide are coming from the burning of fossil fuels, uh, as well as combustion of other things, like wood or Basically, any time you have a combustion, you'll have some CO2. Um, when we're looking at methane, a lot of times it's coming from landfills. Uh, when when matter is anaerobically digesting, digesting, it's also coming from livestock. Um, and, and when we're looking at nitrous oxide, the main source of that is coming from the fertilization of soils, particularly if they're rains after the fertilizer has been applicated. Uh, it's also important to recognize that methane and nitrous oxide have a much stronger uh, global warming potential effect 
uh, nitrous oxide being estimated to be 298 times as powerful as carbon dioxide in terms of its warming effects, and methane being 25 times. Also, we should talk a little bit about halocarbons and the fluorocarbons, HFCs and PFCs, to make it real easy. Um, basically, hydrofluorocarbons are usually kind of more making foam cleaners, aerosol sprays, uh, and the PFCs are coming when we're using solvents, particularly cleaning electronic equipment. Really worrisome is that, one, they have a lifespan that's much longer than other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, 3,000 to 5,000 years, and they're also 5 to 10,000 times as powerful, so in terms of their global warming potential impact. So it's, although the total amount of them is quite small, the strength of them um, has some worrisome dynamics to it. So here we can sort of take a look at how the earth warms up and sort of how global warming works. The big thing to recognize is that basically all of the energy on the planet essentially comes from the sun. Even fossil fuels, which is essentially suns of the past stored. Uh, and the problem is that about 46% of the sun's energy gets absorbed by the earth's surface and about 6% is reflected back. Another 23% is absorbed by the atmosphere and have another 25% reflected by the atmosphere. But when we start increasing the amount of greenhouse gases, they build up in the atmosphere and they actually block the heat back in, reflecting it back to the planet, and the result is that we then get a warming climate. Moving right along, climate change in Manitoba. Um, here we see a graph um, indicating the Prairie Province's temperature increase between 1950 and the year 2000. And you can see that it does sort of start to increase over time. Again, this is, this is only a 50-year graph, so you have to remember that uh, on a larger scale, while there are cycles of uh, rise and lowering of temperature, the, in the fact that in the last 50 years, the temperature has risen as much as it has consistently, is an indication that this cycle is skewed. Uh, change, changes in climate, climatic regions in the prairie provinces. This is um, a projection of what the climate change can look like or the effect that climate change in Manitoba in the Prairie Provinces can have. Again, I mean, the Prairie Provinces being, um, some, of, some of it already being semi-arid will be impacted even more areas such as wetlands would dry out. So the semi-arid areas will become more arid and you would have a lot of shifts in the region in terms of the areas that are uh, either uh, fertile becoming less fertile, less cultivatable, and uh, you have other areas that were dry before becoming um, wetlands. And again, this has this is completely um, unpredictable because we have yet to sort of really start doing hard models of the impact of climate change. Uh, in the agricultural areas in Canada. So the predicted climate change in Manitoba, um, we've already started to see extreme weather events. Uh, what was it? A year or two ago where we had the tornado in Eli, that was the biggest tornado in Manitoba I've ever seen. And it lasted for a long time, which is very unusual in Manitoba. Um, in northern Manitoba, we have melting permafrost. Uh, my dad was actually working up north uh, in uh, Cowboy in Nunavut, and he's <laughs> he, you know he's come back with stories of where you know he's walking along the road and his foot goes through the ground, and if you know he says if he didn't have the foot reflexes that he did, he would have been stuck with his leg buried up to his hip in the ground. Um, other other extremes in Manitoba with changing climate. Uh, more frequent forest fires. If the forest in Manitoba become drier because there's less rain, because the air currents have changed, because the uh, water evaporation absorption cycle has shifted, because the climate is changing, then you have less rainfall in some areas of the boreal forests. You have more forest fires because there's less to impede the spread of the forest fire. There's less humidity. Uh, longer, more frequent droughts, um, and again, in heavier rains 
will happen. Again, this is something that, uh, when it comes to climate change, uh, and because we have no real way to predict, we, we really do not have an idea of what will or will not happen. So as, as I mentioned before, it changes in permafrost. So the, the extent of the permafrost in, in the prairie provinces sort of goes, you know, this, this is sort of the current, current extent of the permafrost and again, the warmer it gets, the more permafrost is going to melt. So the, the shift, is, as, as you can see, is, is quite dramatic. From going from this concept to this concept, the shift is quite dramatic. So when, when we're looking at, at climate change in the prairie provinces, we have to understand that it isn't just above ground that's going to change. It's also the ground itself that is going to change. And if you're looking for consistency year after year, and you do not have um, a, a model to work with in terms of the way that the ground is changing underneath your feet, then as a farmer, you may be in for some massive surprises. And this is something that was, that was true in, in the Great Depression. And this is something that I've heard from my grandparents, that you, know, you have to pay attention to what the land is telling you. Here we see a, a comparison between 1979, Arctic sea ice, uh, the red line, in comparison to uh, the, the area of 2007, and you can see that it's quite a big difference. Now, a lot of people argue, you know, when you actually look at the time lapse uh, from NASA satellite photos, uh, this this area actually, you know, fills in, you know, gets covered with the sea ice. So, like, well, you know, what are you talking about? There's no real difference. The difference is that this area only gets covered in surface ice, which is basically, you know, only a couple inches that is flexible and that polar bears will actually like, fall through. So even though they will argue that this, this area does actually get covered in ice, it is only surface ice. It is not the deep, you know, mile thick ice that the polar cap is made of. So there's a huge, huge shift in the density and the composition of the Arctic polar cap. And this isn't just happening in, in the northern hemisphere, this is happening in Antarctica as well. So we're gonna, you know, we're sitting here in the Weed City, right? So of course, agriculture is, you know, fundamental to the culture and the economy of Manitoba. And of course, you know, when we're talking changing weather, you know, rural people and, and agricultural producers have been dealing with changing weather for, you know, since the beginning of agriculture. But of course, with more extreme weather events, it becomes that much harder to plan for. It becomes that much harder to deal with things. So. This is what it's probably going to mean for agriculture. I think this comment, you know, really sums it up. It's going to be too wet or too dry, but it's never going to be just right. So, I mean, when we were looking at the, the melting ice caps, I think it's also important to recognize that the Rocky Mountain glaciers are also melting. And the Lake Winnipeg and Lake Manitoba, Lake Winnipeg and Lake Manitoba, of course, are the drainage basin. And you can see that it stretches all the way Alberta, out into northern Ontario, and even goes down into North Dakota, then Minnesota, and catches a few, uh, a little bit of uh, is that Montana there, I think, yeah, just a little bit of the very bottom. But you can sort of see that it's a very large drainage basin. But of course, if that water basin is fed by the, the glacial flow from the Rocky Mountains, and that flow slows, then the result is there's going to be less surface water, and slowly things will dry out. And the result, of course, is drought. And another important aspect, of course, about drought will be wind and soil erosion. And you can see that, yeah, it, the wind and soil erosion will be a little bit worse here in southern Alberta and Saskatchewan, but we're still in a high risk period here in Manitoba. And of course, as some of the forests dry out, we're also going to face probably some loss in, as our boreal forests convert to more aspen parkland as they dry out. The other result is flooding, and so it probably seems a little bit strange. How are we going to see both drought and flooding? But the reason is, as the atmosphere becomes warmer, uh, it can hold more water, and that increases the length of time between rainfalls. But it also means that more rain is going to fall down because there's more water in the atmosphere. 
Um, so the result is that even areas where there's going to be more average annual rainfall, because it's going to happen all at once, it's going to be yet less useful. And if anyone's ever had a potted plant that's really dried out and you've tried to water it, you know that the soil wants to reject it at first, right, until it has a certain moisture content. And that, you know, could be some of the results. And this one right here shows, we can see that there's two flows between 1892 and 1945 that exceeded a uh, discharge of 2,000 meters cubed per second. And we compare that between the period of 1945 and 1999, we've got 11 flows. So it already seems, sort of earlier sort of to Kelly's points, that the river flows this year, you know, once again, we're high, we're some of the highest that we've seen. So it sort of makes us worry a little bit. And I think, once again, we need to look at, when we're just looking at weather conditions from year to year, it's all about long-term trends, so we have to be careful. But we really think, 2009, two tails sort of tell a story here. You know, and in parts of Alberta and Saskatchewan, they had a dry spring that they've had in 50 years, and nine municipalities declared emergencies due to drought. Ranchers were forced to buy overpriced, expensive hay, crops failed. Meanwhile, in the inner lake in Manitoba, because they had a heavy rain in the fall before as well as in the spring, five RMs declared a state of emergency because of drought, and 413,000 acres went unseated, and $21 million in crop insurance payments had to be paid. So one of the big questions people ask is, will warmer temperatures improve crop yields? And certainly more frost free days will mean longer growing seasons, be a greater range of crops that will be available. However, Manitoba farmers can expect to see about drops in precipitation about 10 to 20 percent over the winter, but also a 5 to 8 degree warmer. It'll be about 3 to 4 degrees warmer in the summer and about 5 to 8 degrees warmer in the winter, the result being less snow cover. So once again, you have both less protection for your ground, but also less moisture in the springtime. Um, another result, of course, is going to be you know, the heat stress on animals and plants in, in a warmer situation. Um, and also, what, one of the other things they worry about is the result of new weeds and pests move, moving in. Because as the climate changes, yeah, we might be able to grow new crops, but also there might be some new weeds that decide to move in that can be equally as, as problematic. And additionally, when we talk about the overwintering, it's going to make it easier for aphids to survive over winter. Um, and I guess to go back, you know, the director of the International Institute for Sustainable Development, he predicts that about a 10 to 30 percent reduction in crop yields due to climate change. So, you know, the short answer is not likely no, that it, it's not too likely to increase crop yields. So, well, what to do? Uh, mitigation and adaptation, I guess that was sort of on slightly indirectly on the topic. Uh, mitigation involves reducing greenhouse gas emissions or its carbon <coughs> sinks such as boreal forests, such as marshlands, wetlands, um, to prevent future climate change. And adaptation involves adjusting to a changing climate. So these are the two main factors that one needs to look at when thinking about uh, climate changing and how it will affect um, agriculture and how it will affect southern Manitoba. Mitigation, the need to act. Here we've got a, a graph about stabilizing and reducing global emissions. Um, so we've got the uh, historical emissions right here. And this is this is 2005. This is sort of this triangle here. So the current projected path basically just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And that is what is going to happen if we do not mitigate, if we do not actually act. And Canada, ironically, is, you know, even though it, it is a signatory on the Kyoto Protocols uh, to actually act and mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions, <coughs> is not actually doing anything. It has just done a complete 180 and has decided to not do anything and completely ignore the fact that they signed a declaration of international law. So, what the Kyoto Protocols would do is actually help stabilize Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. And instead of actually adhering to and honoring the uh, protocols that they signed, uh, Canada is basically supporting the growth of emissions. That'll just basically go up and up and up. So in 2007, sources of greenhouse gases in Manitoba, you have 36% of transportation, 36% to agriculture. We're sort of trying to get, get through the presentation. Sort of keep talking while we go. Uh, stationary combustion. 
as in um, power plants, 21%. Uh, waste, 4%, other 6%. In addition to climate changes, the increased burning of fossil fuels is likely to drive the cost of fossil fuels up over time. Now, and, and, you know, and again, this is one of the things about being codependent on fossil fuels. If you're codependent on fossil fuels, then the only way that we look at transportation is one that is movable by fossil fuels. So if we actually start to look at our infrastructure and look at the ways that we can change the way that we use energy to get around, it is actually very, very simple. And granted, it, you know, everyone's, you know, worries that, you know, like, how do we do this overnight? Well, it's not going to be an overnight thing. We have to start acting. We have to start working towards change. We have to start asking for 